All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we will turn to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 and verse 11. We're just going to read one verse for uh, our text tonight. We're going to look in a couple of places after that. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writing the second letter to the church at Corinth says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you for the provision for it, Lord, and for uh, what it means to us and how it speaks to our hearts of your glory and your goodness. Lord, tonight we pray that you would honor your word as it's preached, that you would uh, use it uh, for your own will and glory and that it might glorify yourself. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar uh, verses of Scripture, and it was um, the second time that he was writing to Corinth, and at that time he had to be very firm with them, and they were allowing things in the church that should not be there. Uh, they were not going going by uh, what Peter had instructed, excuse me, what Paul had instructed them to do, and as a result, it was a pretty scathing letter. And the second time around. Uh, there is improvement. You know, it's always a good thing to see a yeah. church moving in the correct direction. And I think a lot of times today, one of our biggest problems is uh, we begin to measure that successfulness or correctness uh, by the number of people in the pews. And when we do that, we've erred. But I want you to see he specifically says um, that Satan has a number of devices. <laughs> And I've heard this preached, a device is a tool, it's just anything, or a method, or something you can say, or something you can do to accomplish an end purpose. That's a device. If I want to uh, start an IV on you, uh, the, uh, the needle is not the, 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 the needle is not the IV, the needle is actually a device to get in the IV. And uh, those devices that Satan used, we ought to be aware of them all the time. And certainly, uh, I think we're ignorant, and Paul was concerned about this group of being ignorant of his devices. Now, ignorant is this, just simply knowing, or excuse me, not knowing they exist. That's a true ignorance is I've never heard of that before. The, I've never seen that before. Or whatever it may be, that, that is a true ignorance. It's not stupidity, it's ignorance. Now, I will not say his name, but the majority of you have had him as a pastor, a very young man, at another church at one time. And uh, he, made, he was talking about the devices of Satan, and he brought up this thing called discouragement. And it was the best piece that he had. Well, you know, discouragement is never attributed to Satan. You know where discouragement comes? It comes from yourself. Mm. What is, when, when, when David was at his lowest, what did he say? I, just, I encouraged myself in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, so if his discouragement, listen, he was down and out. Man, everybody was out to get him. And he understood the discouragement that he was feeling. The only cure was the Lord. Amen. And so a lot of times we, we attribute things to Satan that doesn't even belong to him, that isn't, and then things that are quite obviously his, we skip right over. So we're going to look at a couple of different places in the Scripture tonight and, and see exactly what I mean in 1 Chronicles, uh, 1 Chronicles 21. We see of the man we just uh, uh, described, uh, uh, David himself, 1 Chronicles 21, now, David is attributed to be a man after God's own heart. And so I want you to see that the redeemed are not exempt from the attacks of Satan. Sometimes I think that, that the attacks of Satan are looked on as that you have a spiritual issue, that you have a poor spiritual character. But rather probably the opposite is true. If, listen, if he's on you, there's a reason he won't, he's on you. He wants you to be upset. He wants you to be mad. He certainly wants you to quit. And so if you're already in that embarkment of quitting, why would he fool? with you. 
And, and so usually it's the successful, like David, that are attacked by, the, uh, by Satan himself. And David experienced this many, many times. This is probably the best chronicled one. Uh, first Chronicles 21 in the first verse, the Bible says this, and Satan stood up against Israel. Now, the first thing that uh, the attack of a sat uh, Satan can uh, be many folds, but this, sa this satanic attack was against the nation as a whole, and it was against David individually. Have you ever thought about your attack, how it impacts others? When Satan is on you and your response and your, and, and your reaction, how many other people are watching and saying, I wonder what she's going to do now? Mm. And, and certainly that's very true. And so, uh, David, I mean, excuse me, Satan was uh, intelligent enough to know if he wanted to get to Israel, the best way he could do that was to go through David, go through their leader, go through their king and get the job done. And Satan, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel, take a census, take a, a number of all the people that made up their great nation. Now, so we see really the first thing that uh, Satan uses is provoking. Now, when you go on an instant thought, it's most of the time always wrong. If a reactionary event happens and your first response is aggression, you're probably wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you, usually you'll live to regret it a little bit down the road. And so we find when Satan comes our way and he slaps us with something, give it a minute. Give it a little time. Pray. Hold your breath. Stop and wait. Because that provocation, that instantaneous response is going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. It's going to be difficult. And so we find that that provoking manner of Satan is a very, very, very real part of his character. Verse 2, And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even, on, even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. He wanted to brag. He wanted to say, Look what I've got. Now, this census wasn't like our modern day censuses today that we take every 10 years in the United States of America, but rather it just counted the men that were old enough to fight, 20 to 40 years of age. That's all this census included. That's all they, they wanted the number of heads. Now, why did David want that? Number one, I, thought, I think he wanted some bragging rights. And number two, his trust with God was not full. Because if he had trusted God as he should, he wouldn't care how many warriors he had. Yeah. And so we find probably a twofold reasoning, and again, all initiated by Satan himself and impacting a child of God. Verse 3, and Joab answered the Lord, and answered, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be not. My Lord and King, are there not all my lords and servants? Why then doth thou, why doth my Lord require this thing? Why will you, why will you be a cause of Israel to trust, uh, to a uh, trespass to Israel? Now, I want you to see the next thing is, that David ignores advice. See, when you're being provoked and somebody says, stop, Larry, you better listen. You know, and when you're angry, that's a very difficult thing to do. More than once, Donna said, shut up, Larry. And sometimes I've listened, sometimes I haven't. And usually when I haven't, I've regretted it. You know, we, when there's a provocation or a provoking of the devil, the, most, the thing you need the most is advice. The thing you need, the, mo the, the, thing you need the, the most is counsel, godly counsel, people that will listen to you, people that have spiritual concern, and David ignores this. Nevertheless, verse 4, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab before Joab 
Wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a thousand thousands and a hundred thousand. Now, in modern name numbers, that would be 1.1 million men that drew sword that were the appropriate age. And Judah was 400, threescore, and 10,000. And so that would be 470,000 people in the smaller tribes. Altogether, 1.57 million soldiers. Now, you know what? That would be something to brag about. Now, the whole thing was this. If you're, if you're bragging about your army, you're not bragging about God. Don't do things when you're just simply provoked as a boom reaction because it will never go well. Verse 6, But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joel. And God was displeased with, the, with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy, with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose from one of them, that I may do it unto thee. And you know the rest of the story gives him the three, and David was so devastated he couldn't even really make a choice of the three. But I want you to see, even to God being <coughs> men, there's, result, there, there's results of sin in your life. Saved, born-again people, there's still results of sin in our lives. And you just can't go by that, and you just can't whoosh by it and forget about it. That's the reality of sin. That, that, that's the penalty of sin. And so well, you know the, how that he paid, but I want you this all started out is a provoking of Israel. So David, uh, the devil getting in David, Satan getting in front of David's face, saying something and provoke him to movement. Be very careful of the provoking of the devil. Don't respond instantaneously. Now I want to go to the uh, the little book of Zechariah. Zechariah uh, chapter number one. Zechariah chapter, uh, excuse me, Zechariah chapter three, verse one. Zechariah chapter three and verse one. The Bible says this, and he shewed me Joshua the high priest, and this is also Joshua that was the leader of Israel after Moses died. And he shewed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan at his right hand to resist him. Now, so we found two things. One thing, he's going to provoke us to anger, provoke us to movement. And then when we do something right, because remember what Joshua's job was, it was to actually lead them into the promised land, lead them through battles, lead them to occupy their promised land. And we see immediately Satan is there to resist him. Now, if you're doing the right thing and you're following the holy will of God, if the resistance there, push him back. Just get it everything that you have, you have. Pray for the Almighty to help you. And you do what God would have you to do. You look around our ch churches today. You know why? Yeah, you, you know uh, why there's no preaching anymore on godly living? It's because people don't want to hear it. They're going to leave if you do it. And all I can say is resist the devil and keep going. All right. Resist him. When he gives you an inclination to do something that you know is morally and, and spiritually wrong, resist it. Push against him. Where did we ever come down to the point that we think that giving in is, is an option? When, when did grace become such a doctrine that, 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 that it puts a, a stamp of approval on sin in our lives and in our churches and in our homes? It's not that way. Resist the devil. Joshua did. And if you if you follow the life of Joshua, he made some mistakes too, but he was willing to go on in the conquering of the land and the Israel wouldn't follow him. Big mistake Joshua was made was remember when he took that tribe in and said, Yeah, y'all come be part of us. But God's command was everyone die. 
And, you know, they put on their little gowns and stuff and looked all poor. And, and he said, okay, you just come be our servants. You know what? That wasn't God's plan. That's right. When, God, when the devil comes your way, resist him. Now, do you have the authority or the might to say, get thee behind me, Satan? No, because you're not the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not a divine being. So no, but you can resist him. Don't, don't say, oh, that's just how it is, and give in. He should mean Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. It is not this, is it? Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And we know there were both success and failure in that story. They did acquire some of the land, but not all of it. And so, so did most Christian lives today. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter number five, very familiar verse of scripture. And I think I actually alluded to it a minute ago. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 5, as we said before, the church of Corinth was known for very physical carnal sins. They allowed them in the church, and they the people that were doing those things were leaders in the church. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5, the Bible says, uh, and Paul was saying, I've already made my decision. You don't have to wait till I get there. Let the church do it now. To de deliver such a one, and, to, and this was this man that was having a relationship with his stepmother, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, it is a, a good example of church discipline. And to deliver such a one unto Satan. You know what? It's one thing. Yeah, let's put her out. Well, you just remember what you're doing. Now, right. You know, this, this, this makes me a lot more queeny than it did 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's because I understand it better now. Listen, when you do this, it's done. Very scary, scary thing to be disciplined truly from one of the Lord's churches. Now, I want you to see, they're going to deliver him over to Satan for what? The destruction of the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know what? What, did, what, did, what, did, what shape did Job begin to take? Big old bulls. He was having to scrape off the top and let them bleed and drain. And every, every bit of that from the devil. You think illness don't come from the devil? You're crazy. I'm not saying every illness does, but illnesses do come from the devil. And they're sent there, and you know what? Ultimately, the curse on this flesh wins. I've never, I've seen people live to be 110. That's a long time to live, but you know what? That little black man down in Houston County that we called Pappy at 111, he was gone. You see what I'm saying? Ultimately, that will happen. But, so we see another thing that Satan will use is this flesh itself. Aches and pains, and the older you get, the more that you can identify with that. Man, I'd rather just stay home, get up, I'd rather uh, kick back in my recliner and, 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 and just sit here and drink me some Coke, then go back down to the house of God again because I am more completely out. This flesh will certainly get in your way. It will, it will be very much a difficulty on you. And so we see that Satan has a power that most people don't like to mention, and that is to destroy your flesh. <laughs> he does have that ability. And so the next time someone comes up for church discipline, just keep in the back of your head that this is the reality of church discipline. This is how far it goes. This is how serious it is. Because Satan has that authority. He has that ability to do that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians uh, 7, verse 5 again. Defraud ye not one to another, except, be with except it be with consent for a time that 
ye may give yourself to fastings and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. Now, I want you to see the third thing, the fourth thing that he really does is he likes to tempt us. And you know what? I thought when I was young that would be going away as I got old, but it's not true. He just tempts you with different things. Now, when me and Donna bought the car out there at the front of the building, uh, we were looking. And, you know, not that we're rich, but we have a decent credit rating. And we pretty much could have got what we wanted. And, you know, everybody, everybody's pushing us. I mean, these salesmen are crazy. And you just get you a new one. Just get you a new one. We're like, we don't want a new one. We want one that's broke in. We want one that didn't cost more than our house. We just want a regular vehicle. And, but to think that you could and pretty much get what you want, <laughs> Satan's going to use that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Satan's going to use that. He's going he's to make an opportunity uh, for sin there. And so we find that this method really gratifies and glorifies and, and pumps up the flesh. Uh, and what we, simply, <laughs> what we simply need to remember is uh, when his temptation comes to recognize them. Now, what most people reali don't realize is he's not going to offer to kill you. He's not going to come with an offer of heroin and say, let me shoot you up. He's going to come things with like new cars, clothes you can't afford, things you really don't need. And he's going to tempt you. He's going to tempt you uh, to take a job to work on Sundays because it pays more money. He's going to tempt you. One of his favorite. And see, this is the thing with temptation. There's no guarantee to the end. When, when you get tempted and you move on it, there's probably nothing that he promised there, but he tempted you. Is that what he did with Adam and Eve? And once they... <laughs> Once Eve submitted and, and Adam also with her, uh, being aware of who they were wasn't as great as they thought it was. It's just a temptation. And so we find that the devil uses us time and time and time and time again. And he does that to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 14. Second Corinthians 11, 14, again, Paul writing to the church at Corinth the second time, and no marvel, or don't be amazed, don't be taken back, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now here we find a, a characteristic of Satan uh, that a lot of people don't like to th think about, and it's what does he look like? How does he appear? Now, I know the horror stuff that comes from the Catholic Church, the worst one they come up with was the pointed ears and the pitchfork dough. But, dear friend, he is nothing like that. Whatever you, what, <laughs> you know what? Before his fall, he was described to be the most beautiful angel. Mm -hmm. in, in fleshly terms, I'm sure he's a very handsome entity way that mankind can understand it at least. He was something to look at. And he said that if he transfer himself into an angel of light, he can look so holy and look so good and, and, and look so beautiful. And my, my thing is this, if he can transfer himself into a God, to a, 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 a thing that, that God created, he can transfer himself into anything. Women, men, animals, just anything that he wants to. And, and how does he make those choices? Whatever he thinks he can use to, to do something to you. That's what he'll use. And, and, and so we find there, uh, and I will say one more thing about this, this presentation of Satan. I do think it has to be a living entity. For example, I do not think he can <laughs> possess automobiles. But I do believe you can possess pigs, don't you? 
what the Bible teaches, is it not? Now, it wasn't Satan himself, but it was devils that got in that herd of swine, was it not? Uh, and, and, and they ended up even killing the swine in the process. He, uh, he can get into anything that is not sealed to the day of redemption. Any living entity. Pretty scary stuff, isn't it? And, and so we find that the next thing that we can do and understand about Satan's character, you can't say, oh, here he comes. Because you just don't know. He, he, he may look vicious, but probably not. Uh, we, you know, what was it, the church? He said, was it the church at uh, Antioch? No, uh, at Pergamos. I know where Satan's seat is. Somebody was sitting there, right? I don't believe he was sitting there as a spirit entity. He may have been, I don't know. But I believe there was some there, somebody there that was causing trouble that had the presence of Satan. And he knew it. God said, he's there. Be careful. And you know what? I bet that, into, that individual <laughs> wouldn't have been the first one the church picked out either. And so we see then that Satan has this ability to change his appearance, to change how he presents, to pres change how he, who he is. Now, uh, now go to chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. The Bible says this, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations of the revealing of truth, the preaching of ability of the Word of God, lest I should be exalted above measure through abundant, abundance of revelation, there have been given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above all measure. Now, we kind of get back to the physique of man, because at least in Paul's situation, and we all pretty much know it's probably his vision was extremely bad. Uh, he writes that last time, you see what big letter that I write. Because he, he couldn't see it if he wrote normal anymore, so he wrote really big letters. So he could know what he was writing. And we at least think that that was his thorn in the flesh, that messenger of Satan. So we find then, again, that... Huh, the, uh, the, the wording is that it, it did buffet him. And I, I had to look that up, so I wasn't real sure exactly what buffeting was. And it means to knock you down. It means to push you forward, push you backward. It means to put you on your back. And it buffeted him. Well, uh, <laughs> this is how I was raised. If somebody knocks you down, you get back up. Now, it might not always be the best approach in spiritual things, uh, but uh, especially James. James, of course, my, my mom was kind of a pacifist, but James is what James is, and y'all know him. Uh, but he says, if they knock you down and bloody your nose, you better come up. And he, he said, I'd rather come home with two bloody noses than know that you laid on the ground. I'm like, well, you, your nose ain't going to get busted, but I, I try to take some advice. You see what I'm saying? And we know Paul did. He was buffeted. But he kept writing, even to the point that it had to be so big it looked crazy, to write it and, and, and see how big the words were. But he kept doing it. He was knocked down and got back up. Satan knocked him down again and got back up. He got bit by a snake and shook it off in fire and kept going. He, he was three days and three nights uh, in the sea and kept going. See, there's no getting on place. And shows me two things. Number one, those things are all going to happen. It's not a maybe, it's a win. And when they do, and you get the breath knocked out of you, get back up, go again. That's the best thing you can do. And so uh, Paul recognizing this in himself and in himself, he kept doing. So the next time everything seems like, oh, I'm ready to quit, you down on your face, best advice I get. Get up, dust yourself off, and be ready for the next round. Because that's exactly what Paul kept doing to the very end of his life. Um, uh, 
1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We're going to see one thing that the devil can do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 18, the Bible says this. Wherefore, we would have come to you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, it does not say discouraged, as some people would say. It said that he hindered us. Now, to be hindered means to be pulled back. Hindered means there's an obstacle in front of you. Hindering means you can't quite get there for different reasons. If you ever... Uh, been like on your on the way to get somewhere you had a certain time to be there especially here in Stewart County and about six or seven different places four deer right in front of you and you have to stop wait till all the deer go by and you drive another mile and it all happens again and you end up being late you know what those were those were hindrances and the hindrances Paul recognized they came from the devil but you know he probably eventually got there so if you have a hindrance, if something seems to be in your way, keep going. If there's a bill that needs to pay, pay it and then keep going. If, 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 there, if you need to go preach somewhere, get the gas and go. That's all I can tell you to do. You know, hindrances are part of the ministry. They're part of the Christian life. And most of you know it, but on our very first Sunday Lord's Day service, in the old building, me and Don and the kids, I guess we're the only ones there. We may have had a couple of visitors. Some of them are some little girls that we picked up. Uh, but our car broke down on the way over here. About halfway up Bumpus Mills Road. And we called, you know, and I, when my, my children called and asked me something. I was thinking about this, like, Larry, you were doing it in your, in your 30s. And we called Junior Diana, and they let us use their other car. And we went to home to the Lord's house. What was that? So it wasn't a uh, happenstance, was it? Do you believe like I do? Happenstance is an impossibility. Were we hindered? Sure we were. Because I knew if we didn't get something, we weren't walking from Midway Church to, to Dover, and I think we had like 20 minutes to get there. You see what I'm saying? You're going to be hindered. You're going to be slow, slowed down occasionally. Just keep going. Just, just determine within thyself and with the prayer of the Lord that you're going to keep moving forward. That's exactly what we're supposed to do and uh, what the Lord would have us do. So all those are devices of Satan. Now, I'm going to look at one thing we're going to close that is not a device of Satan, but many attributed to uh, a device. It is not a device. It's his will. Uh, we, we alluded to this very briefly. Acts chapter 5 in the first verse. Acts 5 in the, verse, first, the first verse, the Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thine heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Now, we know that Ananias never, made it, never answered this question the best we know. He flopped dead on the floor. But, uh, we know that uh, for Peter to say it, he says, you're filled with Satan. Why, say, why, why, ha why did it happen? Well, the only thing, that the reason that Satan can fill a heart, it has to be no seal there. Ananias was lost. Ananias was not sealed to the day of redemption. Ananias was, was an open vessel. Remember the, remember the Lord's parable about cleaning the vessel and coming home and finding it all cleaned up and then just seven more jumping back in there with him? That was Ananias' situation. It was Sapphira, his wife's situation as well. And with all that emptiness within them, Satan, it's a Satan himself, why has Satan entered thee? 
And he fell down. Well, because he wasn't saved. Uh, why did Satan enter Judas? Because he's a lost man. He, was, he, was, he had an open door. It was right there for him. Why have Satan filled thee? So, in closing, I'll say this. All those tools that the Satan has for us as the Lord's people. And then the, the, the dangerous flip side is if you're an open vessel, man, you're an open door. God help us. On my worst of worst days, I can thank God that the Bible says I'm sealed to the day of rejection. And I may be a pitiful excuse, but knowing that I'm sealed makes me where I can sleep at night. And uh, God help us uh, to understand and know what the devil can do, what the devil cannot do. And I'll say this by and large, it's very underestimated in the day which we live. We need to be very, very aware of that.